Thank you for tuning into this video on the presidency uh, and mainly the kind of introductory stuff as far as like the qualifications to be president and of course the perks of being a president and how they become president. So let's start off with the qualifications, or not the qualifications, but the expectations of becoming president. And oftentimes one of the overarching themes in a presidency unit is the fact that presidents come in with very high hopes and very high expectations. The American public expects the president to solve every problem, to ensure that we are a powerful nation, to keep us prosperous, to, sec to secure our nation from you know, foreign threats. But the president doesn't have all the power. So the power doesn't necessarily match the expectations. Look at recent campaigns. Uh, Barack Obama promised to shut down Guantanamo Bay, our military base in Cuba. But once he was in the job, he realized there was a lot of resistance from the military to do that. And he wasn't able to shut down that base. Uh, look at Donald Trump. He campaigned under the uh, idea that he was going to build a wall on the uh, American-Mexican border and have Mexico pay for it. Uh, that hasn't necessarily, you know, happened. And the problem is, is that Congress and the judicial branch, they both have power as well, power that can restrict the presidency. The president doesn't have, like, the power of the purse to actually pay for building a wall. And the president gets stopped when they try to do things that are beyond their constitutional powers. So the big kind of conundrum, the paradox in the presidency is the fact that we want a really strong leader that can get things done and solve our problems. But we don't want to give them all the power because, of course, the founders and people today believe in more of a limited government. They want a government that's restricted, that all the power is not in one person's hands. They fear that tyranny might form if all the power was in one person's hands. So we have kind of a, a, the great paradox of government. We want it to solve our problems, and we expect the president to solve our problems, but we don't provide the president with the powers to meet those expectations. And we aren't pushing for the president to have those powers either. Now, what does it take to become president? There are a few constitutional requirements. Three to be a citizen, which, must, which means you must be a citizen at birth. You cannot become a citizen later on in your life. You must be 35 years or older, and you must be a resident of the United States for 14 years. Now, natural-born citizen and resident of the United States uh, were added to the Constitution because they wanted someone that would know the United States, have allegiance to the United States, and not be you know, supporting another country if they were president. And 35 year, years or older is an age requirement to make sure that the person is wiser, uh, you know, knows about the government, knows about how things work in the world, uh, and that's kind of the key focus. 35 years is higher than the 30-year requirement in Senate and higher than the 25-year requirement for the House of Representatives. Now, there are some common trends for the presidency. Most presidents have been white, male, and Protestant, with just very few exceptions, like Barack Obama and JFK, who did not meet these uh, kind of typical uh, presidency um, traits. And lastly, as far as um, you know, requirements, and the last one wasn't really a requirement, it's more of just the, the general trend. Uh, the last thing is a constitutional amendment. The 22nd Amendment established term limits. Now, the presidential term is four years, and it used to be you could run for as many terms as you wanted. So someone like FDR was elected to, to four terms of office, four times as president. After he left office, uh, people realized that they preferred having a president for just two four-year terms. So they set up a system with the 22nd Amendment that nobody can be elected for more than 10 years with a total of two complete four-year terms. So someone can serve two years uh, after taking over, after a president's maybe impeached or dies in office. Uh, they can be, be the vice president, become president for two years, uh, then run for office for four years, then run for office for another four years, and that would have their complete 10 years. You can't have anything more than 10 years. 
Now, why become president? There certainly are uh, a lot of different perks from the staff to the chefs to the free living conditions to the $400,000, but none of that compares to the power and influence and prestige of the presidency. You are considered the most powerful person on the planet on charge of the executive branch, essentially a corporation of 2.5 million people and with the largest budget on the planet. You essentially have the world's largest and most powerful corporation uh, in your control. If you were a CEO of a company, you'd be making a whole lot more than $400,000 a year. You know, CEOs of Microsoft are getting paid around like $28 million. CEOs of Apple, $10, $12 million. So $400,000 is nothing considering how much uh, you are in control of and how much stress this job entails. So really, the perks uh, on the screen don't really outweigh uh, why people really become president. They become president because you are one of the most powerful people on the planet. If you think about it, we divide power up into three branches, and you are one of those branches. You don't have to necessarily share that power uh, with other individuals in the executive branch. And on top of it all, you kind of become a historical figure when you are elected president. You are establishing a legacy. Uh, folks like Barack Obama or Donald Trump probably wouldn't necessarily show up in your U.S. history books if they hadn't been elected president. So that running for president and becoming president uh, allows them to have a legacy as president. Now, of course, there's perks like Camp David, which is a woodsy resort, and you get an entourage of Secret Service, there's White House staff, there's Air Force One. All of these are things that make your job easier, uh, but don't really outweigh why they became president, which is typically the power. Now, how does someone become president? Uh, that is kind of the key next factor. There are a lot of videos out there that describe the Electoral College, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but essentially each state has a certain number of electors based on how many members of Congress they have, and your goal as someone running for president is to try and get 270 electors. So you're trying to win individual states. Each state is winner-take-all. So if you win Wisconsin, you get all 10 of their Electoral College votes towards your 270. So if you look at the screen, you can see Donald Trump won 306 Electoral College votes. So he won all those red states. Those red states, he may have won by you know 20,000 votes, maybe some by 400,000 votes. Uh, it's hard to tell from looking at the map because it's winner take all. You win the states, you get all of their Electoral College votes towards your total. Now, why do we have the Electoral College is sometimes a question that people ask. Uh, the most common answer would be that the founders established an indirect democracy. We vote for uh, electors that go vote for the president. So in Wisconsin, we vote for our 10 electors. Uh, if, if the state votes Republican, there are 10 Republican electors that go on and they go to try to vote for uh, the president of the United States. Uh, so... It's an indirect democracy. Think about all the reasons we have an indirect democracy back in the day. Uh, and that's really why they established uh, this electoral college. Uh, plus, it does give more power to smaller states population-wise. So a state like Wyoming does have a lot more influence than they would if it was just the popular vote. And candidates spend a whole lot more time in states like Wisconsin and Michigan and uh, Georgia and when they wouldn't if it was just the popular vote. They would be spending most of their time just in big cities, trying to get as many votes as possible, because the big cities would be the leading factor in the popular vote. Now, another way that someone can become president, or at least acting president, is the 25th Amendment. If the president is deemed unable to continue their duties, essentially the president can be removed from office by the cabinet uh, and then eventually by the Senate. It can be a temporary removal. It could be a permanent removal. So if, let's say, a president was deemed to have, you know, maybe suffering from dementia or something like that, some sort of medical condition that may hinder their ability to be president, 
the cabinet and the Senate could essentially remove the president and put the vice president into control. Uh, now, this has never happened, uh, but what has happened is what's called a presidential declaration. Uh, what can happen is, let's say a president needs to go in for surgery. Uh, so they might be under anesthesia for like three, four, five hours. Do you want you know, us to have no president for three or four or five hours? What happens if there's attack, an attack on the United States? You need to be able to respond immediately. So what can happen is the president can say, I'm going in for anesthesia. I am going to make the vice president acting president for these four or five hours. They are not technically president, but they are filling in for the job. So for example, George W. Bush went in for uh, colonoscopy and he had his vice president take over as acting president temporarily. And then when George W. Bush was back uh, out of the effects of anesthesia, he took back over the presidency. The last thing that can happen is the president can be removed from office uh, via you know, impeachment or death or any of those things, and you might need someone else to take over the presidency. So then we turn to what's called the line of succession. So what's happened is Congress has established a, uh, a path uh, for other people to take over the presidency if needed. So if the president were to die, the vice president would take over. And let's say the president and the vice president were to die, the Speaker of the House would become president. And let's say the president, vice president, Speaker of the House, they were all impeached in some horrible crime. Then the president pro tempore would take over. And then it goes to the Secretary of State and other cabinet members. So it goes through the entire cabinet of approved individuals uh, to find someone to be president. And even if the entire line of succession was wiped out, uh, there would, you know, the House of Representatives would just choose a new speaker, and that speaker would become president. Now, what often happens, though, is whenever there's a big meeting where all these people in the line of succession have to be there, they choose someone not to be there. That person is called the designated survivor. They're hidden in a bunker somewhere, and no one knows exactly where they are. The reason this happens is just in case there was an attack on that group, they would have someone that could be the designated survivor, survive, and become president of the United States. Now, catch is you can't succeed to the president, and you can't be the designated survivor if you are if you do not meet the requirements of the presidency. So if you are a 25-year-old person on the cabinet, uh, you could not succeed and become president. You would just be there. You could never be president during that time. Or if you were born in like the UK and you were a former UK citizen, you may not be able to be um, in the line of succession technically. Well, that's all I'm going to discuss in this video for now. Certainly check out all the videos on Electoral College that are online. Uh, they can be found in my YouTube playlist on the presidency. I uh, hope you learned a lot.